without further ado, uh, I'm going to have Dr. Tim Benke uh, um, start us off. Thank you. So I wanted to thank um, Catherine and the organizers very much for uh, giving us this opportunity to chat to you today about intractable epilepsy. So first of all, this is my disclosure slide. It talks about the other things I'm distracted with. Um, so here's uh, how things are going to go. So um, I'm going to give you this brief introduction. And then there's going to be an introduction to epilepsy by Dr. Staffstrom. Uh, then I'm going to chat about epilepsy and CDKL5, talk about uh, the literature and our experiences with it so far. Then Dr. Olson's going to talk about epilepsy and Rett syndrome, uh, literature and experience, and then we're going to go through some therapeutic options. First, Dr. Olson's going to talk about some pharmacological options. Um, then actually, I goofed that slide up, sorry, ketogenic diet, um, Dr. Staffstrom's going to talk about that. I'm going to talk very briefly about VNS and surgery. Then I'm going to talk about alternative therapies, and then we're going to have question and answer. So we'll just quickly jump over right there to Dr. Staffstrom. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Tim, and welcome. I'm glad everybody could have a nice lunch and uh, still make it to the session and be happy. And I'm going to give you a little chat about seizures and epilepsy 101. I don't presume that anyone here has, uh, is necessarily a medical professional, um, but seizures may be something you deal with with children all the time. It's something we deal with every day from a professional point of view, but this is sort of just an introduction to what seizures and epilepsy are, and uh, w we can take questions. If it's too simple, you can ask me some hard questions. That'll be fine. This must be you. So I'm going to uh, talk about what is a seizure and what is epilepsy, how are seizures and epilepsy classified, and how do we diagnose it, and why do seizures occur, and then we'll uh, segue into how to treat them. And we'll put a spin on this whole uh, talk and session re related to Rett syndrome and CDKL5. So what is a seizure? Um, we can define it as an episode of neurologic dysfunction that's caused by abnormal brain firing of neurons. Some people call it a brainstorm. Um, it essentially is hyperexcitability. It's when the brain becomes overexcited and does something, and what it does has to do with the kind of seizure and where it's coming from. And this can involve altered awareness, altered motor control of losing control of your arms and legs. Uh, funny feelings in your fingers or toes, or change, even changes in autonomic function like blood pressure and breathing. So what a seizure looks like depends on where it comes from. And uh, will I have a pointer? pointer. So, for example, a f this little cartoon of the brain, if a seizure comes from the occipital lobe where vision is handled, perhaps this child will have a seizure related to a vision change. If it's from the area that controls motor function, you might have the loss or shaking of a limb. Epilepsy, on the other hand, is not the same as a seizure. A seizure is a single event. Epilepsy is comprised of having more than one seizure. So if you have a seizure from a fever, high fever, that's not epilepsy. But if you have several seizures that are unprovoked by fevers or other things like that, then you'd say epilepsy. So there is a difference between those two. In addition, we like to describe epilepsy syndromes. And an epilepsy syndrome does involve different kinds of seizures, but it also includes information about a lot of other aspects of clinical uh, detail, such as when it began, the age, what caused it, what the EEG findings are, what the family history or genetics is, what medicines work and which don't, and what happens over time. So an epilepsy syndrome has a lot of information other than just seizure. Seizure is what you see someone do. Epilepsy is more than one seizure with all this other information included. 
So how do we diagnose a seizure from a medical uh, specialist point of view? Well, the first and most important way is by history, and that's why doctors may ask you such detailed questions about the event, about when it started, what the child was doing, what happened beforehand, how long did it last, what were the exact details, what did the eyes do, all these questions that might drive you crazy because when you're dealing with a child having a seizure, you're not looking for all these things perhaps. You're just uh, having a kind of a, a what's going on, let's stop it. But that's why we ask all those questions because we want to determine whether the episode was a seizure or not. And there's many kind of clinical conditions that mimic seizures but aren't seizures. And in Rett syndrome, that's uh, very, very common. Are the stereotopies, the hyperventilation, some of the tremors, some of the other movements that are abnormal but they're not necessarily a seizure. So we take history very carefully and spend a lot of time taking histories. Um, perhaps by the description of the seizure we can determine whether it's a whether it's a focal seizure, it starts in one part of the brain or starts in the whole brain at once. And does it fit in epilepsy syndrome? Those are all historical features. We sometimes use laboratory tests to diagnose a seizure. Um, there's no single test to do that, but we try to rule out infection as a cause and metabolic abnormalities and things like that, and in the case of RET, to get a genetic diagnosis. You may be familiar with EEGs. EEGs are brainwave tests and electrodes are applied in specific locations on the scalp, and then um, the electrical activity of the brain is recorded. And these two EEG examples demonstrate the two major kinds that I'm gonna talk about more later, focal and generalized. In a focal EEG abnormality, you will see spikes or abnormal discharges in one specific part of the brain. In a generalized kind of seizure, the, in the entire brain is like this pointer right now, <laughs> is having uh, spikes at the same moment. So those are the two basic types. And then we use imaging, MRI scans, CAT scans, things like that. This is a very abnormal brain scan. You can even see from um, your own perspective all the white spots here that are diffusely located throughout the brain. Each one of those could be a seizure focus or a spot at which a seizure can begin. This particular child has tuberous sclerosis, another genetic disorder, um, uh, but it just illustrates that we use this modality, imaging, to help diagnose seizures. Now, bef because of Rett syndrome and CDKL5, uh, there's a few other concepts I want to mention that are important for our discussion today, later on. One of them is the concept epileptic encephalopathy. You may have heard that word. It's a long uh, phrase. It means that encephalopathy, or brain dysfunction, is related to the seizures themselves. The more seizures that happen, maybe the worse the cognition gets. And when a child has the second uh, listed, the second listed uh, phrase, intractable or refractory epilepsy, it may be partly from uh, having an encephalopathic or underlying brain disorder. Refractory epilepsy is defined these days as seizures that don't respond to two or more drugs, um, and we'll be getting into different treatments for refractory epilepsy later. Finally, status epilepticus is a concept that you would need to hear, have heard about. It's seizures that last longer than five minutes or very frequent shorter seizures in which the child does not recover their uh, normal sense of awareness between each one. So those are just some other concepts that you might hear words on today. Now, very really importantly is comorbidities. This is a term that reflects the fact that epilepsy is not just seizures, but it's a lot more uh, clinical problems that go along with the epilepsy. So if the epilepsy was the tip of the iceberg above the water, Below the water, which is a large piece of ice, would be all of the comorbidities, the cognitive and mood disorders, the social factors that stigmatize epilepsy, the quality of life which is impaired when a child is having seizures very frequently, and the drug side effects. So comorbidities are sometimes even more critical for the child's lifestyle than the seizures themselves. 
but clearly epilepsy involves a lot of comorbidities. So to classify seizures into two basic types, focal and generalized, um, I showed you the EEG for each one before. Focal seizure means it starts in one part of the brain and may spread from there, but at least it starts in one spot, whereas a generalized seizure starts in both hemispheres at the same time, and one is not necessarily worse than the other. They're just different. And another term you may see is spasm, such as an infantile spasm. That's a kind of, usually a kind of generalized seizure in which it, rather than it lasting for a long time, it's quite brief, and the abnormal stiffening or, or tonic movement will be held for a couple of seconds. Many children with Rett syndrome have infantile spasms, is why I put that up there as well. So focal and generalized seizures, although one's not worse than the other, they are different in a lot of respects, and it matters because we will possibly treat them differently, choose different medications or other options. In a cartoon form, a focal seizure, oops, sorry, a focal seizure will st start in one part of the brain and might spread through other pathways to even from one hemisphere to the other. And if that happens, you, there's another term called focal seizure that secondarily generalizes. It becomes generalized after it starts focally. Or the seizure can start in, uh, and go to both hemispheres at the same moment. Now, why does a seizure occur? We like to think about it as a teeter-totter, a balance between the excitation in the brain and the inhibition in the brain. Now those two words, excitation and inhibition, are rather complicated, but if you think about it, we all have both of them in our brain. We need both to work. It's usually a balance. If the, if the balance is disturbed, then a seizure could happen. And a, this imbalance would happen if there was too much excitation and or not enough inhibition. And various cellular and synaptic factors will affect e each of those two, the excitation and inhibition. Basically, I like to think about seizure mechanisms from the top down, and dysfunction at any of these levels can cause a seizure. So connectivity means how neurons and brain cells are connected together. They're connected by synapses, which are little end, ends of each cell that connect and, and communicate one to the other. Ion channels are membrane proteins in the cell's membrane that determines how excitable the cell is, how much it will fire off. And then genes control all of that. And so from the top down, you can get dysfunction at any level and get neurons to fire in an abnormal way and lead to a seizure. This cartoon shows an example of one single neuron with an electrode in it, in an animal, not a, not a human, um, with nice even discharges firing off in a regular manner. When a seizure happens, those nice normal discharges become epileptic and hang up and last longer and fire abnormally. So that would be an example of, of firing. Now here's a picture of connectivity, several brain cells connected together, and the synapses that they inter interconnect with. So we blow up this and magnify it into that. And then we look at different genes in the membrane. There's genes, I'm sorry, ion channels. There's ion channels of sodium and potassium and other ions. And genes control all of it. Now at the bottom, I took, put a cartoon of the Rett syndrome gene and the CDLK5 gene. And what do those do? They lead to a difference in the seizure threshold. How easy is it to get a normally firing cell to form a, a seizing cell. With respect to those two genes, we don't really know the answer to that yet. Um, we may get into this later in other talks, but aspects of neuron development in Rett syndrome are critically important, and it might have to do with various chemicals that control the structure of the cell itself. And with CD, uh, CDKL5, various neurotrophic factors, which uh, may be abnormal, leading to abnormal neural development. So somehow the genes in these two syndromes lead to a condition in which the brain is abnormally excitable and prone to seizures. So we've talked about epilepsy as a definition, and then I went through seizure classification and why a seizure occurs. 
And now, how do we classify epilepsy? Epilepsy can be acquired, that can be, uh, occur if, you, if someone gets a head injury, or it can be congenital, born with it. And of those of which you may be born, there are structural or metabolic or autoimmune possibilities, and there are genetic ones, and they interrelate. So some genetic uh, disorders cause those as well. But for RET, et cetera, we're dealing with mainly the genetic. So I'm uh, going to go through that just briefly. So in classifying genetic epilepsies, we can think about it um, in terms of chromosomes, sing <coughs> excuse me, single genes, or complex genes. An example of a chromosome disorder that is frequently but not always associated with epilepsy is Down syndrome. And in this case, a chromosome ha is abnormal, leading to various reasons why the cell can become hyperexcitable. In RET and CDKL5, it's at the gene level. So it's an abnormality of a particular gene here leads to the disorder. And then actually most genetic epilepsies are called complex and they involve several different genes, perhaps interacting maybe on different chromosomes, each of which alone would not cause epilepsy, but when several together combine, it leads to that condition. So in summary, I've defined and described seizures and epilepsy, how we diagnose them, some of the causes and why a seizure occurs, and the next uh, part of the talks will be to try to figure out this mystery, because we don't understand epilepsy, but as this news, Newsweek uh, cover in 2009, not that long ago, uh, has put as its subtitle, The Mystery of Epilepsy, Why We Must Find a Cure. And we must for Rett syndrome, as well as all other epilepsies. So with that, I'll stop and let the next speaker take over. Thank you very much. Right. Thanks. So, uh, shifting gears. Uh, so, I'm now going to talk about epilepsy and CDKL5 syndrome. And this part of the talk, uh, I'm going to go through a literature review and then briefly talk about our personal experience uh, within our clinic. And when I go through the literature um, to talk about epilepsy and CDKL5 syndrome, it's not difficult because there's not a lot there. And so when I take you through the literature, I'm going to take you through the literature. So the way I see it, there's, there are case series, there are pooled case series, and then there are cohorts. And basically this is as you get a little bit bigger, you know, you go from a few patients to a lot more patients. So um, really the first big paper that came along was uh, this paper that came out of the French group, um, the three stages of epilepsy in patients with CDKL5 mutations um, from Nadia Bahi Boussong, uh, and this was in 2008. So this was um, the start of the French case series, which kind of got progressively bigger with subsequent publications. But it was 12 patients, and they did a retrospective analysis of the electro electroclinical features in these patients. They were two and a half to 19 years of age, with definitive uh, CDKL5 mutations. And the main thing was this observation that they based on 12 patients, which I think is held through through the subsequent papers, is that there's three stages to epilepsy in CDKL5. Now, you don't necessarily have to hit them all, but this is the idea. Stage one, it's early uh, epilepsy, onset one to 10 weeks of age, and uh, these patients will have a normal EEG background despite frequent seizures. And this phase will kind of come, you know, you know this, it kind of runs you over like a truck. And then there's a honeymoon period. It seems the seizures are controlled, and this can last for one to 30 months. Or you may not have a honeymoon period, but that's frequently described. Uh, the next stage is what we call an epileptic encephalopathy, as Dr. Staff Staffstrom mentioned. And basically, this is the phase when you will see infantile spasms and hips arrhythmia. Stage three is medically refractory epilepsy with tonic seizures and myoclonic and myoclonic seizures. And in this, uh, this first paper, they said that amongst this sample, that seven out of 12 patients were seizure-free at the time of, of evaluation. Um, and the median age was five years of age, which um, is, was, you know, very hopeful. 
So then um, the next paper out of the same uh, French case series, they then expanded it to 20 patients. Uh, the title of this paper was Key Clinical Features to Identify Girls with CDKL5 Mutations. Um, they reduced that slightly. They said it's 25% are seizure-free uh, after two to three years of age. And there was the other important thing that came out is there was no correlation between whether or not you were ambulatory and whether or not you had medically refractory epilepsy. So in other words, you could be ambulatory and yet still have very devastating seizures. So then the French group had this next paper, um, the CDKL5-related disorders from clinical description to molecular genetics. And they took their original case series, which was 20-plus patients, and they then combined it with what they could find from primarily their colleagues in France in the literature. And so it was about 95 patients and 88 were female. All of the previous were, were um, all female. So 99% of these had early onset seizures. That's the stage one. 79% with infantile spasms, hips arrhythmia. So that would be the stage two. And 71% now still about the same neighborhood with uh, medically refractory epilepsy. And they noted that there were, um, now that, that they had this big group of patients, they could try to make some, some uh, associations with things that they were seeing in this cohort of, of, uh, of patients. So they were noting hand stereotypies, uh, head deceleration, in other words, the head grows well initially, then slows down. 32% were ambulatory. 76% had decreased hand use. Uh, they described 85% with visual impairment, and 12% had language. And what they said is, is that they said that scoliosis was uncommon, GI features were uncommon, autonomic breathing and non-epileptic spells were uncommon. Now, this was... Um, which I, you're all going to raise your eyebrow a little bit uh, on some of these. And what they did say is they said that the ketogenic diet was helpful, um, but didn't really give uh, much more information on that. But they said it was helpful, so that's, that's better than, than not. So there is then there's several been, been several case series, and I'll go through them each for you. Uh, this is the Chinese case series, uh, Clinical Features and Gene Mutational Spectrum of CDKL5-related diseases in a cohort of Chinese patients. And they had 10 patients. One of them was male. And basically, the output of this paper was, as they said, that we see a similar course, uh, stage one, two, and three, to the French cohort. Then the next um, type of paper that came out was actually trying to characterize the epilepsy a little bit. And so uh, this is a paper that came out in neurology uh, by Kleinadau that described a distinctive seizure type in patients with CDKL5 mutations. And they described this as the hypermotor tonic spasm sequence. And they saw this in four out of five of their CDKL5 patients. They noted it was between six months of age and four years of age. And they described it as typically, but not always, it would happen on awakening. Uh, the child would have rocking, kicking, there might be a vocalization, last 10 to 60 seconds. And there were some characteristic EEG features, diffuse delta, low, low voltage fast. So those are um, the fine EEG points uh, that we like to take note of because it helps us characterize things. Then this was followed by tonic extension, uh, lasting 20 to 45 seconds. So that means like this and somewhat rigid. And the EEG showed attenuation with low voltage fast. And this would then be followed by extensor spasms, um, lasting 1 to 15 minutes. And these spasms would have high voltage sharps and slows, followed, each one followed by an attenuation. So then there was, um, this is a paper that actually came out of the Italian group, CDKL5 gene-related epileptic encephalopathy, electroclinical findings in the first year of life. And they um, described six infants. And two out of the six, they didn't use the same terminology, but reading it, it gave me the same flavor that these actually had uh, similar features to the earlier paper with what I'm going to abbreviate as HTSS. So then um, there was a US case series. Uh, this was actually out of um, the uh, Mayo group. Uh, historical, clinical, and prognostic features of epileptic encephalopathies caused by CDKL5 mutations. So it was six patients. Again, you know, you're feeling the theme here, not a lot of patients. They noted the similar three stages as the French uh, group. In their, 
experience, all of them had stage two, which is infantile spasms with hips arrhythmia. And this was the first paper that really didn't, that said that they actually have visual impairment and really said this is, it's really there, whereas the other papers were a little uh, wishy-washy on it, I, I think, um, and delays. And they said that all of their patients actually had refractory epilepsy. And in terms of what might help the seizure frequency, though not making it go away, is they said to pyramate by gabapentin and the ketogenic diet were again helpful. But they, it was in, in those terms and not specifically giving us numbers of like what was the seizure reduction in what population of patients. And that's what we, that's what we really want to know. So then there was uh, a German case series, again very small. Um, CDKL5 mutations is a cause of se severe epilepsy in infancy, clinical and electrographic long-term course in four patients. Again, it was four patients, um, but they noted the, the similar progression. They felt that 75% um, had medical, uh, medically resistant epilepsy. And they noted this other phenomena to add into the mix, is that a number of their, one of their patients actually had very late hip arrhythmia. Normally, we think that hip arrhythmia is going to go away uh, by one year of age if you have it, you know, maybe two. Um, but to see it in a nine-year-old was quite unusual, and so they, they reported that. Now, this was um, a retrospective evaluation of anti-epileptic drugs in patients with CDKL5 mutations, and this is the best um, set of numbers that I've been able to find. I, I, I ran across this at the American Epilepsy Society meeting in uh, San Diego in 2012, and it was 34 patients. It's a German case series. And just to draw your attention to the, to the red circles here, basically, if you look at the, at the list, you'll see that everybody is showing up to the party here as far as anticonvulsant drugs. And we're not seeing big numbers over here about responder rates after three months. And the numbers are quite low after six months as well. And one of the issues that they didn't talk about, it was just a poster, you know, not a full paper, and still hasn't come up in a full paper yet, is it's not clear how many of these patients actually achieved a honeymoon or not. But then one of the other things to think about is, is ACTH is typically not prescribed for much longer than uh, four to six weeks anyway. Um, so that, that one's a little hard to uh, understand there. Um, they noted that only one out of the 34 patients was seizure-free. Um, but was for quite long, for nine years. And they did have this other nice uh, piece of information that said um, levteracetam, uh, carbamazepine, car carbamazepine, and lamotrigine, in their words, were aggravating in 35% and discontinued. And again, there wasn't much data to say um, what was aggravating about it other than it perhaps made the seizures worse. And what um, to point out to you is, is that uh, there is uh, a reasonable response to the ketogenic diet. Some people are responding. Um, felbamate was another drug, but again, it wasn't tried very often. Um, clobazam, again, we're seeing a number there. And um, valproic acid and topiramate actually have uh, some responders there. So those are, are things uh, to just point out. So um, the nicest uh, cohort, I think, that we have to look at all of the features uh, in our patients with CDKL5 uh, was this that came from uh, the Australian groups uh, that said the CDKL5 disorder is an independent clinical entity associated with early onset encephalopathy. And basically what they were really doing is they were comparing uh, MECP2 uh, disorders with um, CDKL5. And so this had uh, 86 patients, uh, nine male in that interret cohort. 99% of them had epilepsy. 6%, so much lower than the French experience, were, were seizure-free uh, uh, for at least a year. But then it's interesting, nine out of the 86 were not using anticonvulsant drugs. So they weren't seizure-free, but I think that there was perhaps some fatigue there. Uh, other features that they noted, which were, again, very different from the French experience, was that GI problems were common, sleep disturbance was common, uh, breathing disturbance was common, cold hands and feet, and scoliosis was seen. Again, not seen to the extent that we see it in, uh, in classic uh, Rett syndrome, but it's, it's still there. And so 
Um, the Australian group had some very nice uh, data that we saw with, with how things are going with regards to further characterization uh, earlier in the, in the week there, and so I'm really uh, excited to uh, see their next paper. So this is uh, our experience so far in the Rec Clinic at Children's Hospital Colorado, where we are uh, an IFCR Center of Excellence. So our first uh, Rec Clinic was in December of 2011. Uh, we've so far seen uh, 44 females with MECP2 disorders, age range 2 uh, to 34. This includes one female with a triplication. Um, we've seen 16 with CDKL5 disorders, uh, youngest was six months, the oldest was 20 years of age. We've seen 14 females. Uh, this includes two with large deletions that include the nance horan region, and so they have nance horan syndrome, which is something that includes cataracts. We've seen two males with CDKL5 disorders, and this includes one with Klinefelter syndrome. And we've seen one male with FOXG1 disorder. So what's our experience so far? Again, it's, it's 16 patients. It's, it's not a lot, but this is what we have so far. Uh, seizure onset two weeks of age to six months of age. 58% um, had that stage two um, infantile spasms with hips arrhythmia. And I don't have all of the EEGs on everybody yet, but I think that probably it's more like 69% were really in that age, really in that category. And I, I think that uh, all of the patients that I've seen had cortical visual impairment. Um, and so far, uh, all have been had medically refractory epilepsy. I think 38% have had that um, hypermotor tonic spasm sequence. 44% um, are sitting, 12% uh, are ambulatory. Uh, medications, and again, I'm, I'm not an epileptologist, um, but they're managed by my epilepsy colleagues, but essentially um, the practice is, is to keep trying things, and I think that that's very reasonable. Uh, they've tried all of them. Uh, we have a number of children who have uh, vagal nerve stimulators. We'll talk about that. Um, a number of the children are on the ketogenic diet. Uh, one child actually had a functional hemispherectomy, functional hemispherectomy. I'll talk to you about what that is. And that was actually before she had her diagnosis of CDKL5. And again, I'm not going to be very helpful to you, but I am going to suggest that I, what I think that we're seeing is, is that the combination of valproic acid and clobazam might be helpful. Um, again, I think as we move forward, when we get more data, I, I would hope to give you something more definitive on that. So, um, in summary, the things that I've gone through, as I've talked about those three stages of epilepsy in CDKL5, uh, typically it's medically refractory, and there's some common features and patterns. There's an abnormal EEG background that develops, though it's normal initially. Uh, we see a lot of infantile spasms and hips arrhythmia. We also see this characteristic that has not been described in other epilepsy syndromes that called the hypermotor tonic spasm sequence, and there's late hips arrhythmia. So I will now shift gears again, and so we'll go. Oh, sorry, not yet. So here's what I think we would like to know. Well, we need larger cohorts for natural history. Um, we think that it would be very nice to have um, some findings on history and physical exam or biomarkers for epilepsy and development so we can try to make some predictions. So if we see this, we can expect this so that we can counsel you better. And we'd like to know it may not be individual drugs that work and it might be drug combinations that, that target this best. And certainly are there certain drugs that need to be avoided? And do some drugs improve the background to a greater extent than the seizures? And this might be important for improving development. And is epilepsy really more severe in males? And I think, you know, so far there's a suggestion that um, we're not seeing the males because we're not testing them enough. And so there's probably some ascertainment bias. And uh, there is the suggestion, again, you know, we're dealing with very small uh, numbers. This is that uh, epilepsy might improve in specific populations and it might have something to do with mutation. Uh, in the French group, they've seen that patients that have the R550X mutation is, is that their epilepsy might get better. So that's two patients. So it's, it's hard to, um, I think, you know, we all want to be hopeful, but um, it is what it is, so. So uh, these would be our specific aims and hypotheses um, for um, the centers of excellence as we move forward um, with, with Heather and Walter and 
and Sumit in the, the three different clinics. And then amongst all of the groups, we would like to extend this out uh, as best we can. And the idea is first that longitudinal very structured evaluations can define the natural history of RET and CDKL5 syndromes. And our plan is, is to perform these structured evaluations on our patients. We think that structured laboratory MRI, EEG, et cetera, data collection obtained from these clinical uh, evaluations will define biomarkers that can possibly predict the clinical course. And we're going to do this in all of our patients. And we think that uh, having this is going to be very necessary when we do our future clinical trials, because that's where we think that we need to go. And we're all going to do our best to serve as sites for these trials. So. Um, this is, I think, an issue that you're all aware of, that uh, only the right dose differentiates between a poison and a remedy. And really, the summary is, is we have a lot of work to do here uh, with our natural history studies and hopefully clinical trials in the near future. So now I'll shift over to Heather. All right, I'll just add for our center experience with CDKL5, in epilepsy, I don't have a, a summary slide, I apologize, but um, we've seen a very similar spectrum of epilepsy. Our age range of onset, I think, we have at least some patients with earlier onset than two months, one that was in utero and a couple in the first few weeks of life, so a little bit different spectrum there, but uh, otherwise very similar. So I'm going to talk about epilepsy and more classical Rett syndrome, and then we'll move on to the treatment part of the discussion and start with anti-epileptic drug medications. Uh, no conflicts of interest, so we do have support from the IFCR for our Center of Excellence. So my objectives are to discuss epilepsy and classical Rett syndrome, and the, then talk about pharmacologic approaches to epilepsy, as I mentioned. Uh, so epilepsy and classical Rett syndrome. Uh, typically, we think of, in classical Rett syndrome, epilepsy having onset in childhood, rarely before two or three years of age, in contrast to what we just talked about in CDKL5, um, and rarely after 20 years of age. The prevalence in different series varies um, a fair amount, but it seems to be around 80 to 85 percent, um, most reliably. Uh, and it's possibly less likely to be drug resistant than the um, looking at the epilepsy population broadly, at least in, a, in one uh, published series and also supported by some recent literature from the InterRET database, um, which is a database for uh, classical RET syndrome, maybe around 16 percent versus the whole epilepsy population around uh, 20 to 40 percent. But there are other series that say it is around 30 percent, so hard to know for sure. Um, and what really matters is for each individual is do they have epilepsy or not. Um, but according to published data, the 7 to 12 year group has the highest frequency of seizures, and then epilepsy um, decreases after the teenage years in severity. Um, based on some new data from the internet um, database, there now seems to be, though, the highest proportion of patients with epilepsy potentially in adolescence. So a little contradictory. So this is some data from Dr. Tarquinio et al. that was uh, presented in poster form um, from some of that interret data. So looking at epilepsy remission rates on and off medication uh, in classical Rett syndrome, about, as I said, about 85 percent of the patients had epilepsy. Of those, 40 percent uh, remained seizure-free and off of medications. Uh, the other half that were on medications, about half of those were seizure-free on medications, and the other half were still having seizures. Um, and then as far as duration of seizure freedom, uh, a good percentage, somewhere around 50 percent of patients with the classical Rett syndrome did have a period of at least two years seizure free. Um, so as far as seizure types in classical Rett syndrome, anything and everything um, is seen. Common types are complex partial seizures, meaning those start, starting focally and affecting level of awareness, generalized tonic-clonic seizures, myoclonic seizures, which are quick jerks, um, and patients often have multiple types of seizures and a mixture of focal and generalized, um, like Dr. Staffson talked about. Um, something called ESES, or electrical status epilepticus of sleep, is described. Um, we don't have good numbers on how common it is. Is, and I, from our, my experience anyway, um, it doesn't seem to be very common in classical Rett syndrome. Um, the overall disease severity does seem to be associated with epilepsy severity um, for Rett syndrome, and seizures are one of the largest factors affecting quality of life, which is why you're all here. Um, so there's no one specific anti-epileptic uh, drug medication treatment that's recommended for Rett syndrome, which can be a little bit frustrating. Um, 
but uh, it's, a, it's a matter of balancing the different factors, and we'll talk about that when we talk about the medications. In general, broad-spectrum medications are often used because girls can have um, a combination of focal and generalized epilepsy. Um, of the ones that are most frequently used, ones that work through the sodium channel, to pyramate, levetiracetam are popular um, based on interret data. And uh, with regards to non-medication uh, treatments, there's one case series looking at VNS. It was only seven patients. Um, six of them had more than 50% reduction in seizures, but it's a very small series. Um, and ketogenic diet, uh, like, like we talked about with CDKL5, there's not really great specific data in this population, but it's considered probably beneficial. Um, so with regards to, for Rett syndrome, we have a little bit more information on, on specific genotypes or specific mutations, um, but f actually fairly limited data on epilepsy-specific genotype phenotype correlations, and that's something that continues to be evaluated. Um, so some groups have suggested that what are considered the more severe mutations, meaning having a, a worse effect on the protein and associated with worse clinical features, um, may be associated with early onset or more severe epilepsy, and those, uh, and those might include larger deletions, early truncation, so early stoppage of, of the protein, or some of the more severe missense mutations, whereas milder mutations, such as late truncating, so most of the protein still gets made, C-terminal deletions at the end of the protein, um, or other of the missense mutations may, might be protective on epilepsy. Um, and then there's a little bit of data on a, a polymorphism in the BDNF gene, but that's not as clear. And then some more, again, this is not this is published just in uh, poster abstract form so far, um, but additional data from the uh, in Interet database showed that there are some uh, now specific mutations that seem to be correlated uh, in the MACP2 gene, seem to be correlated with worse epilepsy or less severe epilepsy. And they also looked at some clinical factors um, associated with worse more likelihood, a higher likelihood of having epilepsy, risk for epilepsy, which is difficulty with ambulation, difficulty with verbal language, so the nonverbal children, or breathing dysregulation. Um, the other really important factor uh, in classical Rett syndrome is differentiating seizures and non-epileptic events, um, which uh, though we as, as epilepsy doctors do this all the time, it's particularly difficult in Rett syndrome sometimes because of the other types of events that they have that can be confused for seizures. Um, so it's, it's a very important thing to continue to, to think about. So um, girls with Rett syndrome can have vacant spells or what's called Rett episodes where they may have stereotopies, tremors, different movements, changes in their breathing. Um, these are all, uh, especially the breathing abnormalities we know are part of Rett syndrome, so sorting out which of those are just part of the disorder and when they sort of push into, oh, this might be a seizure, um, can be a challenge. Um, motor abnormalities as well, well repetitive movements. Um, different kinds of increased tone, like dystonia or rigidity, or low tone, if kids suddenly get hypotonia or low tone, or tremors, um, and then episodes of screaming or laughing, again, common in Rett syndrome, um, can be mistaken for seizures, or it can, you know, maybe they are seizures and it's just hard to differentiate. Um, so in light of that, there was one study, it's, a, it's an older study from 1998, but um, I thought a helpful one looked at um, a group of girls with Rett syndrome and did video EEG monitoring. And in those patients, 42% reported um, with, with epilepsy uh, had events during the EEG monitoring that were thought to be their typical seizures, but did not have any correlate on the EEG, so they electrographically didn't look like they were seizures. Whereas at the same time, less than half of the electroclinical seizures, meaning we see um, the seizure on the EEG, and when we look at the video as epileptologists, we say, okay, yes, that's a clinical seizure, and I see the EEG change there. Um, less than half of those were recognized by the family. So in both directions, it's, it's a challenge. Um, and then the other thing to be aware of is a non-convulsive status epilepticus, which we'll talk more about in the next section. Um, but it can be difficult to identify and um, confuse with these RET spells or other stereotypical behaviors. 
So you want to have a high level of suspicion. I won't go into depth about the EEG details, um, but the big picture is that based on the stage of classical Rett syndrome, there are changes that are typically seen in the EEG patterns, starting with in the early stages, fairly minimal changes, maybe just a little bit of slowing, then evolving to some um, epileptiform features or spikes that can be kind of the fingerprint of epilepsy. Um, and worsening of that EEG background, loss of some normal sleep features. And then it's in the third stage in sort of mid-childhood where we see the changes on EEG that we consider very typical of Rett syndrome. They can be seen in other neurodevelopmental disorders as well, but this classic, and I'll show you what it looks like, um, rhythmic theta slowing that seems to not change with breathing patterns or other um, factors is, a, is typical of classical Rett syndrome and it's usually seen more in the childhood years and can persist it into the later stages as well, but not always. So this is what, um, looking at an EEG here, um, what that persistent, if you can see there's, there's the rhythmic activity throughout that. This is only a 10 second page, it's not a long recording, but it continues for, for longer than that and it comes and goes throughout the 24 hour period, not necessarily associated with any particular triggers. Um, this is just an example of some epileptiform activity or spikes on an EEG. And this is another example of a mixture of what we call generalized, meaning spikes that cover the whole page there, and some focal spikes that are in particular areas, and there are different areas on this page. And this is an example of uh, sleep in a patient with Rett syndrome that um, I didn't put up the comparison for you with normal sleep features, but it's lacking some of the features that we would expect to see in this stage of sleep. Um, so this is just a little more discussion. I can skip over some of this about those central theta rhythms. They're sort of different theories on why they exist, but the, the bottom line is we don't actually know for sure, but it's a feature of the disorder. Um, the, the slowing that we see, what we do know about it is it's not related to hyperventilation. So, so normally, when any of us would hyperventilate if we had an EEG on, we would see that our brain electrical activity would slow down. Um, whereas in girls with Rett syndrome, we actually don't see that, but we see the slowing that comes and goes unrelated to the hyperventilation. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears now and talk about um, anti-epileptic drug medication treatments. Um, speaking broadly to epilepsy in general and specifically with regards to both classical Rett syndrome and CDKL5. Um, so for these two disorders, the, the choice of anti-seizure medication, and that's, that's always our, our first step when a child develops new onset epilepsies, we always try medications and most of the time they're helpful ex except that in CDKL5, unfortunately, most of the children end up being refractory to our medications, but we always start with medications and we pick them primarily based on what are the seizure types that we're trying to target. EEG can sometimes give us clues as to what those, uh, whether it's a predominantly focal epilepsy or generalized epilepsy, and we'll talk more about that. Um, and what are the side effect profiles of the different medications relative to what are the concerns about your child. So it's not a sort of one recipe works for everyone, it's, it's different for each child. So we'll talk about the um, alphabet soup of medications, older, newer. We'll talk about those that work on focal generalized or broad spectrum targets. Um, we'll consider comorbidities and a general approach to treatment with medications. Uh, and stop me if I'm running low on time, I can speed up. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I'll go faster. Um, so I, I won't read all of these, but these are kind of the old tried and true medications, which we still use, um, not infrequently. Um, and this used to be, in the older days, all that was available. Uh, and then there are what are considered the newer generation medications, and these are the older of them. Um, the, f the first name is the generic name, and the in parentheses are the brand names of the medications. Um, and the, with this newer you know, expansion in number of medications, it gives us more options. The newer medications overall have a better safety profile, less cognitive side effects, less potential allergic reactions, but they haven't, unfortunately, changed the rate of um, refractory intractability of, of epilepsy, despite having more options. These are the ones that are newer in the, in the recent five years or so in the United States, um, and we're using most of them pretty frequently. The last three on the list are very new and um, still figuring out when we're gonna use those the most. Um, so uh, like we talked about before with focal and generalized seizures, there are medications that are better for focal seizures. Sometimes those can actually worsen generalized seizures. Um, so in 
in Rett syndrome and uh, similarly in CDKL5, we often pick broad spectrum medications, broad spectrum meaning they work for a variety of different seizure types, both focal and generalized. Um, and then for infantile spasms specifically, it's a little different than other seizure types. Um, ACTH, which uh, is a steroid and bigabitrin are our top choices for spasms as far as medications go. And then there are second and third line options and non-medication options as well. Um, so in considering comorbidities, again, I won't go over each of these in detail, but each medication has um, things that, for example, some medications work on both seizures and migraines, so if migraines are an issue, you choose those. If weight is either high or low or is an issue medications, you may choose to avoid or choose based on, on that. Family history of kidney stones comes into play for some of them. Um, mood or behavior issues, um, for example, Keppra can cause irritability. Um, if there's heart block, you would avoid leucosamide. If there's a short QT interval, which is part one of the electrical rhythms in the heart, you would avoid rafinamide. Um, and then for each medication, there's a long list of, of side effects um, that you would consider and with regards to each patient. Are you willing to take these side effects versus how beneficial is um, the medication to be? And of course, you don't get all of these side effects, they're just risks. Um, so again, I'll skip over some of these in the interest of time. Feel free to ask me about them later. Uh, and then the other thing to consider is just interactions between the medications. So there are some medications that rev up the liver enzymes and maybe make other medications be metabolized faster and others that inhibit some of the liver enzymes and maybe increase levels of other medications. Um, I highlighted kind of the key ones in each category, but there's, uh, there's overlap and you always want to think about how medications interact with each other. Um, and one, separate from enzyme inducing, there can be other direct interactions, for example, uh, valproic acid in inhibits the clearance of lamictal. Um, so if you stop valproic acid, you actually need to double the dose of lamictal. It's a more direct, quick interaction. Um, then there are rescue medications. Uh, so in the out-of-hospital setting, you're probably most familiar with diastat. That's what, you, what we use most frequently. Um, it's a rectal form of diazepam. Some countries are using more nasal midazolam, and it's starting to be used a little bit in the U.S., but isn't available in a reliable form right now. Um, and sublingual Ativan is sometimes used as well. And then in the in-hospital setting, we use intravenous, intramuscular, or interosseous if we can't get those options, um, Ativan or diazepam, and specific protocols for status, which we'll talk about later. Um, so factors to consider when you're choosing an anti-epileptic drug medication are the specific seizure types, the side effect profiles of the medications, um, drug-drug interactions, the mechanism of action and how it um, you know, is favorable or unfavorable with other medications and whether you choose broad spectrum versus focal medications. Um, the need for laboratory monitoring can be important. If it's very hard to get laboratory tests for a patient, you may try to choose something that it's less critical to get frequent um, monitoring for uh, and what form the medication is available in and how that'll work for your child. So um, as a general approach, whenever possible, we make one change at a time. We titrate medications to affect tolerance and levels. Um, if it's ineffective or intolerable, you want to wean the medications. Consider possible synergy and mechanisms of actions. Seizure tracking systems can help us um, so that we have a reliable um, tracker of how, how much we've improved or not improved on, on different medications. Um, and when it's refractory to medications, consider other options. Uh, and like I said, there's not one recipe for each patient. It's really very individualized. Um, and we hope going forward that there will be choices that are more specific to the underlying disorder. But right now, it's um, based on the factors we talked about.